without any uh, no benefits, no insurance. Yeah, no, yep. No, no. I mean, they did a lot of work to get um, accredited. Mm -hmm. Credit is right word now. No, you're right. They, I mean, the, the classes were good, uh, but I mean, the father's point, you know, you have to have the lunch room, and then you have to have parents come in to help with the class of lunches, you know, hot lunch was, was the topic of, of discussion at one parent council meeting. You know, how do you have to have a hot lunch for all the kids? You know, security. security was a huge thing. There was, when I first started, there was a big discussion about a door monitor because we didn't have the proper locking system. Um, there was a lot. There was, there was a lot. The drop-off zone. Some people use it as a speed speed trap and you know throw the kids out. Other people come in very slowly. I and so the thing's correct for those points. I guess to your point, um, Elia, that I think about sometimes is um. So parochial school, maybe it doesn't have to be parochial school, but it's like in the education method, um, we look at our group, right? We're always like the same, like maybe max 10, 15 people or whatever, sometimes more, sometimes less. Um, I think that's always a big sticking point that unless it's something that they have to do mandatory, how do you change an attitude where people are then called to learn and to grow? And I think that's where we struggle because uh, it's not a desire. And so that's when I talk about like 2.0 church, you know, you're almost talking about, dare I say, impossibility. Why well, I say impossibility? Because obviously nothing's impossible with God and we have faith. But my goodness, to think about like we're trying to move mountains for growth, you got to look at like churches where their whole essence is missionary and proselytizing. When I say missionary work, I'm not thinking of the hypothetical like if I send someone to Africa. I mean, even local missionary work to preach and spread the word and then to welcome. And then, but you got to have a you have to have a strong knowledge of your own faith. I think that's where we that's our first problem. Many of us don't have a strong knowledge of our faith, but in turn, we can't even go into the attitude of inviting people, welcoming people, and encouraging people to come and see. And so that's why I think about like 2.0 is I'm like, wow, what 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 can 2.0 be? You know, what am I offering to the community? What am I offering to people? Um, what am I offering to you know those who who want to desire Christ? And if if I'm showing a come like here's an example. I've had some people inquire, like, hey, you know, I like to come to your Bible study. So, okay, great, come. Uh, they're like, why do you call adult spirit, adult spiritual enrichment? And then I have to tell them the truth. And I'm like, well, realistically, it is Bible study, but we had just gave it a different name to spice it up. Like, do you guys need to spice up Bible study? Now, this was someone who was not Orthodox, definitely a Protestant background. Because yeah. remember, that's their whole that's their gumption. I mean, when they have Bible study on a Wednesday or a Tuesday night, right? And then they have their prayer service or whatever over the weekend with their sermon. I mean, that Bible study is a part of your worship life throughout the week. My goodness us, you can make up, call whatever you want, and um, do what you got to do. And sadly, we can't do it because people don't recognize or see the necessity to want to learn and grow. That's when I question about the 2.0. It's not that I'm questioning that there's doubt. I want to see a parish that's at a large stance, like us five, 600 families, and what they are doing is a 2.0 parish. And sadly, everyone always constitutes the money. I don't care about the money. I care about the core. What is the core of the church? What's its goal? What's its vision? What's its mission statement? And what's its drive? And that's where I try to kind of dwell and understand that capacity. Um, just food for thought. I think about it myself too, but you know, that's reality. That's why, who knows? Maybe we are the pioneers. Uh, maybe we are, and we are very blessed. I mean, I look at a lot of stuff. I don't have to struggle to think about Hey, we're going to pay next month's bills. Hey, you know, I, when I was thinking of Chicago, I remember Father Colson and I would have talked like we'd have to turn off the air conditioning during the summer months in the church so that we could just save money. I mean, that's pretty sad. I mean, literally, just to have the air not going to circulate. We, I mean, we're talking about we're talking about extremely frugal. You know, churches in Greece don't have air conditioning. They open yeah. up the side door. They also don't have. <laughs> yeah, but they also you know, they Christianity has survived 1,900 yeah. years without yeah. air conditioning. I don't want to hear that. Correct, but they also don't have the sizes. <laughs> they don't have. Yeah. They don't have the demands for the lives that our churches have compared to them as well. Too. Plus, most of those churches in Greece were actually built better than our, our common churches now. Look at Saint Demetrius. Saint Demetrius was a uh, it was a Jewish parochial school that was converted into a church. It's not sound to be St. Demetrius, Chicago. Oh. Uh, it was, it was yeah, not St. Andrews used to be a synagogue. Uh, St. George's with the Lutheran church. 
you know, very few of them were built in the city and were built as Greek Orthodox churches. So that, so, you know, those are, so like those, are, well, even our church, like our church, I've talked a lot of, uh, I've talked a lot of HVACs. And you know, that's one thing that kind of hinted at me as well, too. They said the thing about is to put a large or some type of span in the middle of our, our tube ceiling so that we could just circulate the air. He says your air from the, the, the tubes that pop out of the, the, the cylinder of the apse of the nave of our church, it is literally a 25 to 30 degree difference. You know who gets the most effect of that? The choir loft. Oh. They have absolutely no <laughs> circulation up there. And I didn't think about that. But And then he says, if you just circulate that, that's also going to circulate going towards the ground level as well, too. And that might be something that, okay, we think about. I've seen other churches that have fans. Or if we figure out something else, because it, it's just, it's the thing. And then the other thing we have to do, he tells with, like, with our church as well, too, is that we have to keep the flow of the air uh, at least some continuously so that if you have a service the next day, you don't just have it off, but you have it at least some point, so you just turn it lower so you can ca catch up. Because if not, to, to pull down that thing is so difficult. It, you it, open everything at night. Fungati. You think of the fungati. Well, I think the fungati, and this is my own it's personal so thing. Straight. Yeah, but the fungati has an issue. I think it actually has a legit ventilation issue there where that it is not getting the circulation that needs to get. It's not all voice. Yeah. Even winter, summer, it doesn't matter. Like you guys, I don't know how you guys breathe back there. Cause it's just like every time, like when I go I'll do a great entrance and I walk through there, and I'm like, oh, like it hits you. It's just so, you got candles, candles. you got candles, you got people. I was going to say, Saint, you know, your church, St. Carlos, during Easter when it's packed, yeah. is very difficult to breathe on. It, 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 well, the biggest issue with our church is our windows. We don't have opening windows. Even if yeah. I had the air on or whatever, just to open the windows would be really beneficial. Yeah, no, I think the only church thing up when they open the windows, and that yeah. helps a lot. The only, you know, it's the only thing that open. I think that uh, the stained glass on the very bottom, um, yeah, to open. So it's well, it's you got that door. You, you got that the door wire up there. That, that's kind of yeah. 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 No, Greg, like you were saying, you, you think like your church. You built the church. The problem is you you lost a little bit too, but. During, during time. Time. Yeah. Your seating. They, 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 they made it. it was not as long as the old St. Sophia was, and yours is more tall than it was length. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I think that the total building is a little bit longer because we stretch off into the street because we used to have an area where we used to have a, a drive through for our uh, neighbors, and that's gone now. So, I mean, um, yeah, so it's it's longer. And it stretches a little bit. Yeah, but you know what they gained? They gained the flexibility for like their altar. For oh, their, yeah, yeah for, we didn't have an altar before. It was a Baptist church. Yeah, you know? it was really tiny. Yeah, Did you ever right. see their altar? Yeah, right. Their altar was so small, the old yeah. one. I remember when I served there. I mean, you could maybe fit like four priests in there. Yeah, it was right. really tiny. Yeah. Same with the back area. So now that they were able to do that, they can uh, do a lot more. Right. So and, and, you know, right. And we didn't have a back at all because we had the entrance was at the side. You know, um, you know. So it is definitely had, wider, though. And then they did. Oh, look, it is definitely wider. It's wider, and it's it, it seats more, but yeah. it's not a huge more. Uh, you know. Plus, you have a choir loft. Well, well, we had a choir loft before too. But this, I, did you have any seating that you have up there now? In the choir loft now, you couldn't. You know, before, I mean, if you ever went up there during Easter, I mean, it was, you know, you would just sit there and die. Oh my gosh. All right, everyone. Well, thank you for uh, joining us tonight, uh, Father Chris and our friends here. This is so. Tonight is our last night that we are meeting for this semester. Uh, we are going to uh, take a break for the summer. We will get back together after Panagias. After Panagias, we will get together with a new book. I am most likely for the first semester of the fall, we are going to start be going into the Gospel of St. John, the theologian, uh, even into the evening group as well, too. And then I'm hoping for the spring semester, for the beginning, and after Pascha to then go into the book of Revelation. Uh, I have not done a Bible study on the book of John. Uh, or on the book of Revelations, because they are usually very, um, they are, I always define them, they are very deeply theological and upper sense level spirituality, especially when you read and study them. The hope is that, as I've seen many of you now for the last four and a half years, that we've had our discussion with everyone else that comes on, we will try to enhance them. And I'm going to add supplemental readings of commentary on John and on some stuff for the book of Revelations. Just so that when we read them and study, because we probably will not get through the entire books, both in both semesters, possibly the book of Revelations because of its details. 
Um, possibly we'll finish in the spring, but Pasco. Pasco's late next year. Pasco's May 5th. That means Pentecost next year is on our, on our festival. So get ready to kneel and then mix with life. Yeah. Um, but yeah. When I was in school, uh -huh. which is a long time ago. Really? Yeah. They said, we are not ready to understand the revelation yet. Yeah, that's what everyone says, but at some point you got to look at it. Now, 16 years later, they say that all the time. Remember my dad, too. I used to ask my dad about the book of Revelations and even John. But you got to understand, he let me he let me read John. Now, as I was a kid, and that mind you in ancient Greek, I didn't understand it. I was reading it. It was more to, like, kind of get my, like, my Greek and my language to kind of start flowing. But I wasn't comprehending what I was reading. I, I understood some stuff like, oh, this means this. I get it. I understand what this chapter is about, whatever, but not to the detail of like theology. And that's why he wouldn't let me go farther because, like, okay, that was enough. So I read the four, got, for the four books in ancient Greek. The hardest for me was Matthew because it's so long. And to read all the genealogy and stuff like that, oh, my gosh. Well, Mind you, I was reading the Revelations. Only John is in Revelation, right? What? Revelation. John, John Rory. Yeah, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the four. And, um, and the reason why I read the four was because I got in trouble. My um, I did something. Or that. It was like I was getting in trouble, and then my parents didn't know how to punish me. And it's like I was also like playing video games then. So it's like, well, we put him in his room. He has a video game. So got to do something. So my dad being an iconographer, and he'd be like, hey, it's like, okay, why don't you start reading? I always had to read while he was painting so he could hear what I was saying. He would correct me. I remember the first, oh, my gosh, the first few days I was doing it, it was torture. It was like an abyss because every word I was butchering. Hey, well, this, that, or whatever, it was just butchering. And I'm like, oh, this is terrible. Literally, it's like, it's like, it's like, um, like you think of like at school and it's like, do it wrong, next, do it again, uh, wrong, again. I'm like, which one am I saying wrong? You'll figure it out. <laughs> like, okay. So then I figured out like the bigger words or whatever and uh, wherever the tone was. But um, what ended up happening is then I started getting a flow and then I started seeing it and I started recognizing it. And that's actually really what helped me to understand and how to read the scripture better. Uh, but yeah, it's. In Greek. Yeah, in Greek. English is English. And he's like, he knew it. Well, then what he do, he would then bring an English Orthodox study Bible, and he's like, look at them. He's like, try to compare some of the words so you can understand it. But, you know, he would give me a, a short exegesis. But my dad's not a true theologian. He has studied himself. I do give him a lot of credit. He knows a lot more than most Orthodox Christians do. But, you know, to really offer an exegesis of Scripture, you have to have multiple viewpoints to understand context, to understand language, to understand words, so that you can actually get how it was compiled why it was compiled and for what do we gain from it from there so uh that's what was but my was what 11 years old again it was realistically a form of punishment but uh a punishment that i know to this day i gained something from because obviously i still remember it and uh my like i said my funny i don't know if I all my funny stories about it was even when my dad was taking a nap i'd read it next to him so i could pretend like oh yeah i read the skipado that's done he's like no you didn't i'm like yeah when you're sleeping he's like but that doesn't count. I'm like, well, I did it. So um, <laughs> and by then, so the best part of it is I did the whole thing. And it took me maybe about a month, you know, whatever evenings I was there with him. Because I obviously had other activities or sports or whatever, but it was, took me about a month. All four chapters, all four gospels, right? But I was doing a lot. Just and mind you, I wasn't studying, just reading. Do, 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 do. It's not good enough. The New Testament? Yeah, for the four books. But I was just reading. You understand what it, it's like? It's I'm not even comprehending. I was 11 years old. You know, on the basis of this and this theory that all wisdom comes from God and the divine wisdom. That's all I was doing. I was just reading it. Oh, you couldn't understand. I it. wasn't paying it. I put no effort to understand it. Okay. Now I understood if it was in ancient Greek or the you know. It well, yeah. I mean, it, it's it's what the Iagoras were in Greek now. You know, what I mean, it's the same thing. But I didn't understand to comprehend. He would say some stuff or whatever. Fine, but you know, and then okay, and there are some stuff where it's simple. Where we're talking about like you know john baptized okay i get it you know those are not that hard but like john and uh i liked mark was a short you know you're just going through do, 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 do. but like matthew was hard and just trying to do it and uh again like i said respectfully it was a form of punishment because you know he saw that i he literally but i used to laugh at my dad and he sometimes would tell even other people he's like i don't want you to become a water brain and i'm like what does that mean and what he was trying to say was like he doesn't want my brain to become mush Right, so he's like, I don't want you to. He's like, I don't want you to be on water brain. He's still laughing, yeah. and I didn't know what. Is that a term though? Yeah, people would call it that. I think what that would be. So it'd be a water brain. Yeah, I don't know. 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 Yeah, I don't know.
It's it's a disease in America. Yeah, I have a Yeah, water, but I mean water in your brain. I've heard it. Yeah, it is. Among it's other things. Yeah, but is it defined as like being like stupid it's or much? There is a disease. It's it's associated with um, stupidity. Those kids have big yeah. heads. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's. I think that's. What it's, I think that's what's about. But I never understood. I'm like, why would you say that? You never it's said hydro so cool. yeah. It's yeah. so it's so great. Yeah, hydro yeah. yeah. I know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but that's stubbornness compared to. Look, he's, 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 he was trying to imply that I was going to become stupid by playing video games, which in truth that is because you're just it's my it's my numbing it's mindless. That's what video games do. Video, video games is better, than, is better than television because television is just happening. You know, at least video games, you've got to make decisions, make a process. Well, some I mean, there's some games where even now, I mean, my gosh, you could play something and. You you find the cheats and it's like well I defeated this one and it's like you accomplish something well did I really like, well I made the effort to find the cheat to then accomplish what I wanted so I did something in that manner I guess it's in the eye uh, eye of the beholder so okay so we're gonna go to page sixty nine and these are the ones that we were talking about last week where this is really like a Q and A it says the ne the necessary attributes of a spiritual shepherd and the the context on the bottom states that the present text represents a small section of one of St. Ignatius's large and more important books, the Pastoral Handbook. Published in 1898 during his directorship of the Rosario School, and named primarily in his students for their use as a textbook of pastoral theology, it has been argued that its contents bring the saint into line with the great fathers of the church who pen works on the priesthood, such as Chrysostom, St. Gregory the Theologian, and St. Simeon of Thessaloniki. This particular excerpt focuses on the education formation of priests, placing perhaps surprising emphasis on the acquisition of learning all kinds, albeit without compromising spiritual cultivation. The relevant section translated here appears under the title Epicta Dianotica Prosonda in Matima Pimandikis. Pimandikis, as we know, is um, shepherding, right? So it's in other words, literally lessons in shepherding, how to be a shepherd. How about that? from 1898 in Athens. Okay, so it says, the first one, what acquired intellectual attributes must a spiritual shepherd possess? He states, first, philological and theological education, second, ecclesiastical formation, and third, encyc encyclopedic learning. <laughs> uh, I can tell, you know, the third one for me, and I'm going to give some of these stuff as like a firsthand uh, perspective, the philological, well, theological education, ecclesiastical formation is exclu explicitly taught to us in the seminary. The, the ecclesiastical formation is like the uh, divine services, having a phronima, having a guide and respect for the divine services. Theological education and theology and theosis and all those matters as well, too. Philological, obviously typing into philosophical as well, too, goes into a, a, pra a practicum and practical attitude to apply that into our formation. And the third one, which I think is very important, is encyclo encyclopedic learning. Why do you think he said encyclopedic learning? I have a term that I'm going to use, but I want to see what you guys think. Why do you think he said that? It's related to the rest of the world at the time. Most well, priests were not into that, so because most people weren't into that. They Good point. In college. Right. So uh, you have a wider concept of the world than what you're talking about will fit into it you can show where it fits into it that's how you argue it right and to, and to various people encyclopedic means like from poor to rich from educated to uneducated i would almost put it to the attitude of like like i would think of my parents other people that tell me the sponge attitude so whatever interaction you are participating in you try to absorb to learn or to yeah to learn so then if you ever have the participation, you can then educate someone or guide someone. Hypothetical. Um, you know, just because if you're a doctor doesn't mean you can't you can't do common sense applications, how to hammer something, how to fix something, how to work something. You know what I mean? Problem that we have modern day is once we find our concentrated profession, man, those blinders are completely enhanced. That's all I see. And I try to tell people, okay, I know you're so focused on that, but don't lose sight of big picture as well, too. I think that's what happens with people as well, too. So when they lose that, I mean, it is. It's quite comical. I know many physicians. I know lawyers as well, too. Man, greatest in the field. You ask them a simple finance question, like, nothing. Just do this numbers, whatever. 
I gotta grab a calculator. Can you give me a minute or two? Some ways we've gone backwards because we've become more really specialized because there's so much to learn in specialization. I mean, it's sight of the rest of the world and where is yours fit in? And what has now become the greatest commodity in the professional world needed? Uh, greatest, yeah, ne yeah, what's the greatest commodity? What has become the greatest commodity needed in the professional world? What type of job? Like trade skills? Plumbers, electricians, physical laborers, all those stuff. And my God, I talked to some of them. Well, when you look, when you, yeah, when you hear what they're making, like, what? And I'm like, so, and you know what's truthful? I think about this too. Um, we, as people, both culturally and society, we have constituted that when you are a lawyer, when you are a doctor, you're already in this, you know, my goodness, it's the same attitude uh, of, um, of someone who gets a doctorate in like education or a doctorate in another field that is not like the medical field. And then they say, you must call me doctor, do, 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 do. And I laugh about that because oh, there was a movie. God, it's got to be in the 90s where someone was like that. And he kept correcting the person when they were talking to them. And they're like, I'm doctor. And they're like, yeah, doctor? Like, like doctor of sociology. What is PhD. that? So they have PhD. But I want to be called doctor. Because they have it. I got it. I've earned it. You're going to call me a darn it. To each their own. But it's just so funny when... We have to apply that and to force those answers. Goes back to what we're striving for, we're looking forward to. Let's go to the next one, number two. Why should philological education be considered a necessary attribute for a spiritual shepherd? Because it is the foundation of every science and the means of acquiring all knowledge. It cultivates and readies the mind, rendering it a suitable instrument capable of contributing to the successful accomplishment of the spiritual shepherd's holy mission. I'm in awe that this comes from a hierarchy of the church. Yeah. I think that's what this is, blows me away. If this was like a general theologian that was not an ordained clergyman, I would have seen this is a normal statement. But to come from a hierarch, a reputable hierarch that he was originally before he was slandered and everything else, in 1898, mind you, is pretty profound. What is this holy mission that a spiritual shepherd seeks to accomplish? Okay. First, to shepherd the rational flock well, which has been entrusted to him. We are given, by the way, that flock to shepherd at our ordination to the priesthood when the uh, presiding bishop gives us the amno, which is the body of Christ that is on the patent, the bishko, after it's been consecrated, and he gives it to us and he tells us that we are to keep this and to return it back to our Lord when he had when he asks it of us at his dread judgment seat and his second coming. And that's the on every priest. That's very powerful because that means not only am I charged to maintain and take care of the body of Christ, I have to not only take care of him physically, I have to take care of his spiritual body, which means every single one of us. It's a very big responsibility. And I think most clergymen would say that's probably the most moving part of your ordination, not only just the aspect of being ordained. But that part as well too, because that's the charge. That's like that. That's the great. That's the commission 2.0. That the great commission, the first one to go out into all the nations to the presbyter. That is, they're called to serve. It's right there. And your hands are like that. It's a. Hand, it's like your hands are in an emotion of piousness, to be holding the body of God in that in your hands, and to know that they, you are called to keep it and to protect it in that manner for your right, your holy mission. Two second to lead this flock to perfection. Wow. Lead. I'm not perfect. How can I leave? How can I leave my flock to perfection? Third, to teach this flock the gospel truths, interpreting the holy scriptures. Okay, that makes sense. Fourth, to correct those who have sinned. Now, I'm going to ask you guys a question. What do you think he means by that? By correct? From the sin. To help them. The that they are. That they got their problems, and then as your as your spiritual leader, you're, you're supposed to come and help us because, uh, get away from the sin that they have more. Yeah, that's a good point. No, so it's just a, I use the correct term here as like a sense of like um, the Greek word odigima, guide, and not the orthono. Uh, the orthono is like a, literally to mean to correct. 
I think it was like the Odiga Mount, it's like the guide where it's because remember, we talk about certain ways that it's us falling off the path. Well, I think a priest is just there to kind of be like, come to the side where you're falling off, say, like, hey, let's let's try to stray this way. You know, let's come back together. Because why? Because he's falling too. He struggles. So if he needs help to go back to that place, he should also be able to give the opportunity to give any type of correction. And the correction is like you're saying that you're you're wrong, right? Or it's incorrect. Uh, and sometimes it's not that matter. Sometimes correction just means like just switching your path that you're on. I think of like trains on a, on a railroad track. You know, make sure you put the right lights on and they put you on the right tracks. If not, you could just stray so far off that you don't even know how to get back on, right? So that's where I think the terminology of correction comes to play. Not of not of admonishment, but more of putting it in the right place. And what's his the, probably here, it says it here to to the students of the uh, uh, at the of uh, the Rosario School. Oh, okay. Use it as a textbook of pastoral theology. Okay. So we did at our school at, at, Holy, at Holy Cross. We had a class called pastoral theology, and there we would learn about how to be pastorally um, reasonable when we would serve people. Examples: It would be um, you know ethics. It might be. Um, Going to a hospital, speaking to a person, handling a situation, you know, different stuff. But also, and then they did. The one thing they gave us for a good rubric was the best example. That's why they highlighted before, too, was St. John Chrysostom. Lily has a book on the priesthood. And St. John, my gosh, his his charges on that one, you would almost want to give it to every priest and say, please make sure you read this and know what it means because it will be asked of you forever like that. Like even here, this could be the checkpoints of every priest what they need to have on their day-to-day -day basis. Because then I have to follow these accordingly. Because that's what you're called to do as a priest. Now, I know this means for a spiritual shepherd, right, as a hierarch, but we are representations of that episcopal in our parish life. So then we have to participate in this. It says, the last to continue the work of the apostles. And what was the work of the apostles? The Great Commission to go out into all the world. At the baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Question four. Is it possible for the bishop to fulfill his office as holy mission if he lacks education? No, because the lack of education renders one entirely unsuited for the holy and loft mission of the Episcopal office. Wow. That's profound. Very, very straightforward. Why? Because the lack of education betrays ignorance, naivety, ineptitude, a lack of spiritual cultivation, and the like. How can one who is unlearned, one who is guilty of the charge of ignorance, prove capable of all those things his pastoral efforts are to be turned toward? Such a one essentially brings ruin to the church's holy mission and clearly frustrates and works against the hopes and expectations of the very flock which he is called to shepherd. Wow. Then it says, is someone who is unlearned and unscathed fit for the pastoral office then? No. Who should be considered fit? One who has learned, who has broad knowledge, and who has achieved spiritual met maturity. For the learned and wise spiritual shepherd alone always acts as is meet and right, bringing to fruition the divine end at which he aims. He alone builds up, supports, and benefits the Christian people that he shepherds. He alone succeeds in advising, admonishing, rebuking, both privately and publicly as proper and in consoling as is needed. Be ready, the apostle enjoins, in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and teaching. That's from uh, Timothy, uh, the second book of Timothy, chapter 4, verse 2. Why else should a shepherd be educated? First, because a spiritual shepherd is considered by all to be an erudite. I think that's how you pronounce it. Erudite. 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 And learn man with a deep knowledge of principles, beliefs, canons, rubrics, and the spirit of the church in general. It is to him that they turn for information and answers to their questions. Second, because he has said over the wise and unwise, over the educated and uneducated, and he ought to inspire and respect the conviction in all those he teaches. Third, because he is shepherd of shepherds and teacher of teachers, his speech to both Shepherds and teachers ought to be absolutely authoritative. Wow. Fourth, because it would be unfitting for one of the masses to be made shepherd of the rational sheep and teacher of the wise and learned, since when a voice like a trumpet and a word of power is needed, 
such a one will keep silent, speak weakly and feebly, or else will speak wildly, saying offensive, unsuitable, unseasonable things. Worst of all, he may be misled by the artistry of his intellector and blindly and blindly follow him, becoming a disciple rather than a teacher. In this case, he'll be alienated from the truth and he'll pass his life deceiving and deceived. What did you guys think of that one? Heresies have been taught. All right. Turned a lot of people back in the older days, even today. You know, that 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 paragraph there, especially about the charge and to what is called about the learn. You know, whenever I've heard the the the, the theory and ancient idea that they say that the the road to hell to Hades is paved with the skulls and the bones of hierarchs, priests, and false teachers makes a lot of sense because we we're called to serve and not to be served. And I look at Christ on his great sympathy that he had for his own creation. If he wanted to unceasingly and continuously, he could have admonished every person he was with because everyone was a sinner. But he had mercy, he had compassion, and he looked at them with a favor that never existed before in life. And so when you have teachers, false teachers, false hierarchs, uh, false principles expressed into our lives, who's to blame? The one who followed or the one who taught and led incorrectly? That is why I then look back into how Christ's attitude was to the scribes and the Pharisees. And the hypocrites was so harsh was because they were the ones deceiving and uh, misleading the faithful. They were the ones who had ego, pride, and stuff too. And if you actually look at many of the heresies, all these individuals, their their goal was not for unification. It was for agitation. It was for stirring the pots. Arius, I mean, we, we see it pretty explicitly. He wanted to go against the grain. And then the the wisdom of the Holy Spirit to come together with the great sovereign Constantine to call all these bishops as we celebrate the first ecumenical council shows that when things are united and that people come with humility and selflessness to the betterment, only beauty and the glory of God can be shown forth. And that's what we have. But the problem is, sadly, you know, I was thinking about this today too, because people, you know, there's a lot of people who talk on different outlets, you know, communications, um, you know, social media, discourse, stuff like that, and especially the old calendarists. And um, the old calendarists have an attitude, obviously, that they're pride, that they're right, and this and that, always. And they always have to stick it to the new calendars. You guys are the ones who change, it's not fine, whatever. I don't, I never get into conversation with that. But I've become somewhat discouraged in modern day, not about so much about the bishops, but everyone's always banking off of like a council to come together to, um, guide the church in this centuries, plural, and um, there's never support. There's never support. In other words, there's always doubt, or there's always the attitude of how unholy those hierarchs are that are leading us currently, and that the more I think about this, the more I think about how I lose hope that the church can ever get to the point where it was with the great council that we're able to get together. And the problem why I'm saying that is it's not that I don't trust in the bishops. I actually don't trust in the people. I don't see an attitude ever where people will be hopeful that hierarchs who they look up to will come together in a sense of humility and selflessness to bring modern day issues to a present level, discuss and then establish proper canons and guidelines to help the modern day Christian. Because if you look back, we still have canons that date back to the seventh ecumenical council. And we know the seven great ones. Other than that, they're all titular councils that, oh well, hearsay, whatever, you don't have to really obey and follow to the end degree. And then you'll have modern day councils like you have the one in Creed. It was more of a scene, actually. It's accomplished nothing. Were they able to talk about social ethics? Were they able to talk about 
the dish of cremation. Every day I get that talk from some Greek. And what about it, this and that? And this is the same thing. There's no answers. There's no answers. And now we got new things. We have new sciences. We have new forms of technology. We have new forms of birthing. Who's going to get What do we do? Go back to a canon from the fourth century that says, you know, use leeches for medicine? Mm -hmm. I, mean, I read it from someone's article today that, you know, how we're called. But the problem then, there's also a problem in the, in the underlying that we have canons as commandments. That we take on a canon of the councils as commandments. It's the Ten Commandments that God has given us. Well, this is what it says. If that's the case, I would be excommunicated. I would be the frock, and I would be the post for what I've done. You know, the person said it was pretty funny. He's like, you know, um, um, uh, you know, for a priest to go to a pub and drink with someone, that that would be grounds for being excommunicated. Because I always remember reading. I used to laugh. Um, if a priest is to ever be with a Jew and participate in something with a Jewish person, they are to be first reprimanded, and then if they continue it, then they are to be deposed and defrocked. Go to a Jewish doctor. Yeah, go to a Jewish doctor. But they don't go. Uh, they don't communicate them. We, I know. It well, bishops in gay bars. Yeah, but 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 it, it's not it's not the practicality to modern day. What do you do to the modern day, not only for priests but for the faithful? Because realistically, you do realize one of the greatest struggles of modern day Christianity is there's no uniformity. There's no. This is how we are to work together. This is what we need to do. Because you can come to me, I'll tell you one thing. You don't like it, and go to another priest. Oh, he'll say this, and it's a little bit softer. Well, you know, priest is a little bit more harder. I know this priest allows this. I know priest allows that. You know, you get all those excuses. Then what do you do? Hmm? We're allowing. We're educated. We are allowing division preach. and dissension to come into the church, and that is why the foundations and structures are weakening. Because we are not coming together. And then the problem that the worst problem of it is that all that is existing right now is the attitude of ego and a false education. I think a lot of our hierarchs now, even us clergy, have a false education. Do whatever context serves us. Look now. Can I that's why I said I cannot see a a, a um a sit uh, uh an ecumenical synod. Of all the canonical Orthodox churches to get together, I mean, first of all, they have the enormous division of of uh, Ukraine, Russia. They're in a war. How are you going to bring them together? Okay, you have patriarchates that don't talk to each other. J Jerusalem and Antioch have some division because uh, um, Jerusalem put a, bish a bishop in Qatar. How dare you? That's our lands. In Qatar. There's a lot of foreigners in Qatar. But they didn't allow anybody there. Oh, no. Qatar is very... 80% of Qatar is not foreigners. Yeah, Qatar is very open now. No. Same with Dubai. They, they but yeah, it's, it's, yeah. It's, it's sad. Because then, who are we to look up to? I said Sunday. You know, who are role models? When I hear this stuff, so sometimes we need a, a complete self-examination of top to bottom. Priests, too. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we're innocent. But well, this is tough because then who's gonna who's gonna guide who and in what manner? And that's why, like, when you see any of these situations, why I think I, I love you know I do because I'm in it. But I read stuff like the Archdiocese sends like on uh, social media and says, "Oh, this is what the communicate comes from the Archdiocese. This is what they had at their synod meeting this month." What does that mean to a modern day Christian or lay person? Jack squat. You're in Palatine, Illinois. What does it have to do with you? I'm working. I'm struggling. I have my family. Why do I care what they do in Timbuktu? What does that guide mean? Does that help me? Now, I'm not trying to talk about the selfish manner. I'm actually talking about the general application manner as a Christian. That's why we know it's not like the Catholic thing. With their local diocese, they also get, they should get the local people. That's our problem, is that because of not only the patriarch case of how they are in size and where they're at, you know, it's almost physically impossible for them to understand every individualized thing. And they're really, their only conversation is their local bishop, right? Because I knew that's how they worked in the past, right? We're talking about 1,500 years ago. They would send to their bishops to those dioceses, and then they would report what's going on and stuff like that. Well, Central America to 
to the patriarchy is night and day, let alone language, let alone participation, stuff like that. We see the multi pot, that's why it's so hard in the United States. We have everything and in, in between and out, you know, outer. And they get their thing, and what are they going to do? It's hard for Greeks, uh, you know, in Greece to understand what uh, religion is like in America, you know, and uh, you know, where you have so many different Christian denominations. We'll continue. Well, I'll, it, well, I'll ask a question. Any one of you, any one of you, didn't even, and that's yeah. just kind of crazy. Any one of you said a relative in Greece? And they've come here and they've come to church. What what was their experience to you? I don't have a, a relative. But from Latino side. The comment that we heard is that um, uh, the, the Greeks in America are old school. That we still do all the old customs and that has changed. But they don't do it as much. Maybe people way overdress here. We are more religious here than Greece. Well, the one thing that I've heard from most Greeks that, that I've heard that have come to our services or even seen our services, like say they watch them on live stream, they are pretty in awe about how spiritual, how faithful, how dedicated, and how in some manners is more beautiful than what they have there to their present level because of um, the centralized attitude that we have in an individual parish because you know they have so many churches like we said you have one down the street you go down two other blocks there's another street you know another church whatever here you know everyone flocks to this church or to a church and then they come and see this representation and then they also see that you're not only holding the language but you're holding every other stream that it, it attaches to life you know you're talking to different people you're talking to this you're trying to instill culture you're starting to try and instill faith you're trying to instill education wow them you know what their worship, you turn it on, go. They have a small catechetical school. Sometimes now with like church, uh, cities diminishing, they have like one church or two churches that are the catechism churches. And catechism, again, is mind you, Sunday school. It's not means that they're proselytizing to old adults. That's what they call it. That's why when you ever hear me in Greek and I say, that's Sunday school in Greek. Yeah. And so that's really what's going on in Greece. So they don't have, oh. they don't have Bible studies. They The priests offer... Priests offer. It's mandatory. Yeah. Also, the other thing is, anymore. not anymore. Not regular school. It is. You know, no, not that I believe so. People here, people here, people here, people here, here build are. churches. They, 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 they attend churches, churches that were there 500 down. years ago. It's still part of it. I thought that was not part of it. Can you say I'm sorry? Well, you know, like you know, I'm just talking. In fact, I'll be talking to my cousin this weekend. But you know, uh, she was stunned that we would be building a church because every church that she goes to has been there for 500 years. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it is. It's pretty and all. And, and you know, and I remember, you know, you know, she sent over some money for our church, you well, know, just because she'd never done something. The a new thing. generation doesn't take religion in school. Okay, that, that might be different. I was always, I was always yeah. very impressed by Greeks from Greece because they understood religion better than we did. Mm. Because you know they have religion. Our generation. Okay. Right. generation. Let's continue with the, let's continue with some of these questions. We got a few more minutes to get moving. Um, number nine. Why else is it necessary for the bishop to possess a philological education? There is no other suitable aid, no weapon or means more effective and proficient. Then speech, when it comes to rendering him capable of performing those lofty duties, laid upon his shoulders with fitting precision, and of successfully fulfilling the sacred mission of his office. Speech is a weapon by means of which one may defend against the attacks of the enemies of faith and truth, and ten, tear down their ramparts. It is an excellent medicine which cures those who suffer from illness. It is an effective instrument by which of means of which to raise up those who have fallen a proficient means of governing. It is most useful in every situation. Since there's no more effective and more powerful weapon than speech, neither is there one more fitting to the spiritual shepherd. It follows that he ought to acquire from himself power of speech to the greatest degree. Wow, okay, interesting. You're talking about law school. Well, are they, you know, I see it, you know, as a priest, it feels like I wear many hats. It even something to feel like I am a lawyer, where I'm like, you know, I'm trying to handle or speak on behalf or know how to speak in the correct ways. And that's very true. I mean, think about not only just in the sermon, how, how a bishop or, or a priest speaks amongst congregation or in scene or in political, I'm sorry, or in any general setting is very indicative of the person. You'll have a priest who's very podiatical village, which means somewhat uneducated, or you'll have the ones who you can see who are 
proficient and to speak either theologically. We talked about in the past that there are even defined priests who are called hierokitics, right? And those hierokitics were the um the um the, no, the theologians, they were the um this is the ones who go out for the sermons, right? They were the preachers who would go and preach throughout the land. That's pretty pretty profound. But those definitely for an educated one. Definitely not just someone says, Oh, Etito Diabas, Etito Catalano. No, they also applied and spoke eloquently and openly to the people. And usually most of the um something you know, most of the Eurokinics that I know were always usually our commanderates. Why? Because then they would future become bishops. It's like kind of like a stepping stone leading up to it. What has been proven by what we have said here? That's number 10. That education is valuable currency, an effective instrument for every situation, most useful and very necessary to one who takes the shepherding and administration of the great rational flock. Have there always have there always men who have thought the opposite about the education of bishops? Certainly. When? During virtually every era. It seems that contrary views have been expressed from the time of the great fathers of church as Basil, Gregory, and John combat such con contrary opinions. Okay, let's go to the next page. What arguments do these gainsayers forward? They forward the following arguments. First, that the apostles were not learned. Second, that the Lord promised his disciples that he would give them both mouths and wisdom when they were brought before kings and tyrants, which all of your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. The apostles say, were, they say, were tax collectors and fishermen and were thus untrained and lacked worldly wisdom. And yet they became piercing preachers of the gospel, drew the nations to Christ, overcame the profound philosophers, silenced the eloquy, eloquent rhetors, persuaded the polytheistic pagans, put to shame kings and tyrants, and they proved the hierophants, the rulers of the temples, the preachers, the scribes, the whole chorus of priests and hierophants of the various religions to be in delusion. Should not these found worthy of the priesthood, their successors, follow the apostles' footsteps when it comes to the administration of the church and the performance of the mysteries? Our Savior enjoined, therefore, settle in your hearts not to meditate beforehand on what you will answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries not be able to con contradict or resist. According to the unerring testimony of the Savior, then the all Holy Spirit speaking through the holy apostles is guide and govern the church from the beginning. It continues to do so today. It will continue to do so until the end of the ages, and it rise up successors to the apostles, servants, and liturgists of the mysteries. Divine grace ever strengthens weaknesses and covers shortcomings. The Holy Spirit, therefore, renders those who in faith and piety and living devoutly take on the priestly office efficient, perfect, and consequently self-sufficient apart from secular wisdom, fools in service of the church. How then is education and wisdom of any use? To what end is such labor and great toil? All that worry and headache does not go. The celebrant of the church's mystery is not expected to convince and teach with words of human wisdom, but with the power of God and faith. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. And that is from John, the universal letter of John 1, chapter 5, verse 4. Number 14. What does St. Gregory the theologian say to those who say such things who shamelessly advocate ignorance? See what he worldly says to these. Give me but one thing. Can you exercise devils? Deliver man from leprosy, or the dead from the tomb? Does the paralytic have his limbs restored by you, or does the touch of your hand on the ailing drive out the disease? It is by those means that you'll persuade me to hold learning and small esteem. And in his funeral oration on St. Basil the Great, he says, We must not dishonor education, because some men are pleased to do so, but rather suppose such men to be boorish and uneducated, desiring all men to be as they themselves are, in order to hide themselves in the general and escape the detection of their wants of culture. Wow. Moreover, Chrysostom says, hear what he adds further in his directions to Titus about the appointment of bishops. The bishop, he says, must be holding to the faithful word, which is according to the teaching, that he may be able to convict the gainsayers. But how shall anyone who's unskillful as these men pretend to be able to convict the gainsayers and stop their mouths? Or what need is there to give attention to reading into the Holy Scriptures if such a state of unskillfulness is to be welcome among us? Such arguments are mere makeshifts and pretexts, the marks of idleness and sloth. Hard condemnation from Christendom, huh? While Gregory the theologian in his poem on himself and the bishop says, the shame of being associated with such hucksters of the faith should be intolerable. Some of them are the offspring of tribute mongers, whose only concern is the falsification of accounts. 
Some come straight from the tax booth and the sort of statutes you get there. Some from the plow with their sunburn still fresh. Some again from day-long exertions in the maddock and the hoe. Some have just left the galleys or the army. They are still redolent of bilge, bilge. bilge water or exhibit the brand on their bodies. What a sudden change of roles is made. You, sir, were a mime in the public theater yesterday. Today, you provide us with an extraordinary spectacle all by yourself. How meek you, part, you appear to me today. No one had changed his clothes with as much ease as you have changed your manner. <laughs> Next one. What do we mean by theological education? The science of theology. We mean that the bishop should possess theological knowledge acquired in a scientific manner. In other words, this theological knowledge should be com composite, but not confused and disordered, such as proceeds from random and varied reading rather than from scientific examination and study. Hmm. Number 16, why is it absolutely necessary for a shepherd of the church to possess scientific theological education? Because this and this alone will be able to help his own flock mature and advance toward the perfection of the divine Paul speaks of, opening for them the divine words of the Holy Scriptures. For the chief aim of theology is the church's benefit and progress. Hmm. It has been systemized and rendered particular science for this reason. Abstracted from this aim, this systemization of theology and its being rendered a particular science is to no end. Ergo, if the principal reason for the theology is the benefit of the faithful and their progress toward perfection, the bishop is thus particularly duty-bound to possess it, and consequently theological education ought to be the foremost among his intellectual attributes, since otherwise he will be found negligent and neglectful of the foremost of his duties. Why else is theological education a necessary attribute? He must be able to give an account for his own faith and answer the questions of all who will have them and address them to him. He will succeed in this aim by theology alone, since theology alone is able to penetrate the depths of the Holy Scriptures, mining them and expounding them scientifically, and to approach the true spirit of the church. Moreover, the purity of the Christian conscience depends upon the refinement of Christian knowledge, since the more refined one's Christian knowledge a constituent element of the Christian conscience, the more refined this Christian conscience will be, transformed from a darkened sense into something pure. And Christian knowledge is refined by the careful study, and as far as possible, the exact setting forth of the truths of the Holy Scriptures. Without knowledge of theology, how can one accomplish this? How can he teach? How can he catechize? How can he correct? Any doubts? Doesn't this make sense? Sounds straightforward. Why else is he obliged to possess theological knowledge? On account of the flock's conviction concerning the shepherd's theological knowledge, which leads them to accept what he says is divine law and not doubt or dispute it. Why else is this necessary? For the sake of theological education, the members of his spiritual flock, since he's obliged to excel all others in this regard. For what other reason, and important at that, does a bishop need a theological education? Because the Church of Christ the Savior has been submitted. And the truth and worship of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church has been entrusted to the office of the bishop. The bishop is thus the keeper of the divine and holy canons, the bearer and guardian of the holy deposit, and the protector of the holy tradition. Thus he becomes the judge of truth and falsehood, of piety and impiety. The preservation of the evangelical truth until the ages depends on him. Behold the reasons why it is necessary for the bishop to be theologically educated. Well, wow. heavy stuff. What do the friends of ignorance who reject the strength and power of speech think about theological education? They reject it because they consider the works of the Holy Fathers to be good but excessive. It is enough for us to believe, they say. Moreover, a precise knowledge of ecclesiastical history and of the dogmas down to the smallest detail, a broad reading and deep study of the Holy Scriptures, a detailed examination of homilies, an appreciation of their beautiful structure, all these things are works and duties belonging to theologians, not to the bishops. Their work is good administration. <laughs> wow. Now, that's funny. That whole paragraph, especially about precise knowledge of ecclesiastical history all the way through to um, the beautiful structure of the homilies and examination, it's pretty much what we go through through the seminary. We learn about ecclesiastical history. When we have a dogmatics class. We have understanding of reading and deep study of the Holy Scriptures. Examination of homilies, that's a homiletics class scripture, preaching, all these things. And then it says their work is good administration. And I will admit, one of the weakest classes at the seminary is only a semester long. 
is parish administration. What a coincidence. Do any refute this deluded mindset? Understanding the magnitude of this error, which had entered into the clergy and to the church from such a deluded and evil belief, the greatest teachers of the church issued judgments against it. They went so far as to preach with boldness that the apostles were not unskilled, ignorant, and unlearned, as those haters of learning gleefully say they were, for rather they were wise and learned. Not only did they refuse to see this point, but they went further, forwarding another view in response. According to this view, it was not simply through their living and unshakable faith, nor through divine grace alone, but the holy apostles performed great superhuman works, or rather, it was also the pers persuasiveness of their wisdom and the power of their speech. Christum says that the apostle Paul alone was a leader in human wisdom, while Gregory, the theologian, extending the idea, asserts that all the apostles, without exception, were armed with the weapon of speech, so as to more effectively reach the gospel. That's pretty powerful. And I actually think that's very true, because wouldn't you, recommend, wouldn't you agree to that, especially when you look at the church fathers? All the church fathers are offering commentary, and they are offering exegesis of the scriptures. So where Paul is the leader of human wisdom, we see here the apostles are armed with the wisdom of speech, right? To eloquently speak and enhance into the attitudes of homiletics and sermons to strike at the core of the people, especially those in the liturgical worship. That was through the Holy Spirit, right? They were not educated. Uh, the, the church Paul. fathers were. Paul Paul was an educator. Paul, Paul was, was yeah. right? Uh, but that, mind you, in neither his... wasn't. No, but in his humility, neither was. Don't forget, John, the theologian, was not educated either as well, too. And his is probably the most eloquent and sweetly speaking of the scriptures that we have, both his gospel, not only revelations, but his, his epistles, those universal letters, if you ever want to read them of John, they're not long. They are so beautiful. And it really defines about how God is loved and enhances that to apply it to our own lives as well, too. 23, why is ecclesiastical formation necessary? Because without ecclesiastical formation, it's impossible for the bishop to fulfill the holy duties assigned to him. And you will stand in need of teachers instead of teaching others as he thought, as he ought. True. Okay. What do we mean when we see ecclesiastical formation? Complete knowledge of the holy tradition of the church, the ecclesiastical order, the rubrics of the service, and in general, the whole operation of the church, as well as an ecclesiastical music. Oh, that's a good one. Wow. All of that. That's uh, tough to apply even to modern day. Are those found lacking this knowledge worthy of the priesthood or episcopacy? No, because they're deprived of the precisely that knowledge which they ought to have most fully. By means of this knowledge alone, are they able to fulfill the duties of this priestly office in their entirety? Without this knowledge, first, they will be unable to complete their sacred duties. Second, they will be ignorant of the holy tradition of the church, the unwritten portion of the gospel. And third, they will sin, making mistakes, and they will be humble, receiving correction from those subject to them. Wow. What does the Apostle Paul command Timothy concerning the holy tradition? This, O Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust, and this, you, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you've heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. That's a great charge. What is made clear by this? That the spiritual shepherd ought to know the holy tradition, and as far as possible, convey this to the faithful men. We'll, we'll finish up with these last two. We'll go up to 29, and then we'll stop there. Why does a spiritual shepherd need encyclopedic learning, just like we asked before? Because without broad learning, he will run into very difficulties. Right, Jim? Today's society, more than any society before it, is laden with men entirely deprived of religious formation upbringing with novel opinions, blind and full of pretension, who deprecate the meek out of the ignorance, who are dashed to despise what is sacred, and who have no time for the holy. If the spiritual shepherd is lacking broad and encyclopedic learning, he lacks the means and necessary arguments to repel and to stop the mouths of those who boldly contradict them, and he runs the risk of losing many of his spiritual flock. Why else does the spiritual shepherd need to possess encyclopedic learning? He needs to know the boundaries of his pastoral jurisdiction. Ignorance in this regard is among the greatest of deficiencies. For on account of this, the bishop might either overstep the bounds of his own jurisdiction and enter into foreign territories. Or he might allow others to invade areas that fall to him. The consequences of such actions are undesirable in both cases. On the one hand, in overstepping the bounds of his jurisdiction, he will draw criticism and be put in his place. On the other hand, 
If he gives ground, he will be derided and mocked. So if he is to avoid stumbling in his labors and desires to do what is proper, he ought to know precisely the limits of his jurisdiction and the legal consequence of his proper and improper observance of it. To do this, he must have exact knowledge of the canons of the church. That is to say, canon law. So by means of these, he will be able to guide the church to rule in ecclesiastical questions and to frame directives according to the spirit. It is not enough for him to simply to have experience of the canons and ecclesiastical institutions because simple experience will not allow him to make faith lawful and reasonable application of these in practice, nor when it comes to legislating, would allow him to produce things harmonious with the spirit of law as a whole or with the canonical consciousness of the church. Okay, I didn't realize we have one more page. Last one, we're done, okay? Why else is it necessary to be a polymath? Polymath. Polymath. Polymath, right? The bishop must be a polymath because he needs to know that the belt, the beliefs of the heterodox churches, that is to say their dogmatic teaching, so as to be able to refute these and to probably defend the dogmas of his own church. Also, the bishop ought to know the beliefs of those who attack the religious moral principles of belief in general, so as to be able to tear down and counter these. Encyclopedic knowledge is needed, then so that he might be able to repel any attacks of internal and external enemies of the church, to answer all questions with a convincing word and to put all towards sound teaching. The bishop who takes on the pastoral office today has a greater need of varied knowledge than the bishops of times past. In former times, the knowledge of the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, along with knowledge of the pagan religions, was sufficient. Today, however, beyond the aforementioned things, and also one, uh, one also requires encyclopedic knowledge, because today heterodox teachings are greater in number and more systematic, and their, attar- their attacks are better, stronger, and strike everywhere. The shepherd of antiquity needed to fight against the heretics, but the war took place on his own field, because the heretics of that time did not deny the authority of the sources of the church's teaching, since they recognized both the Holy Scriptures and the Holy Tradition as such. He had to confront the Jews, but their arguments were able to be refuted and torn down using the Old Testament. He had to confront the pagans, but these believed in the existence of a living God and they recognized the power of religion. He also had to confront people who were entirely irre- irre- religious, irre- religious. But the con- contest with these was an easy one, since the attacks of the opponents were unsystematic. Things are different today, however. Today, the authority of the cr- sources of Christian teaching are attacked with the full force of historical, critical, and philosophical research. research. The Holy Tradition is rejected. The authority was of the Holy Scriptures under attack, and the first principles of Christianity, indeed of every religion, are warred against, as is the very existence of God and the distinction between matter and spirit. Today, the true shepherd of the church is brought face to face with such ready opponents, and he must confront them so as to keep his flock safe and to restore, if possible, those who have been led away from the path of truth. To emerge from this contest, contest victorious, he needs a wealth of theological, philosophical, and encyclopedic knowledge. To counter arguments levied from the Holy Scripture for the Holy Tradition, he must have precise knowledge of these, together with a knowledge of the historical critical method, so as to be able to examine and expound upon these as his opponent does. Moreover, so as to be able to confront those arguments against the church of Christianity proceeding from history, philosophy, or physics, he must allow, he must also immerse himself in those sciences, thus enable himself to give answer employing these. That's pretty, pretty strong stuff that um, St. Nicodemus speaks about the role of a spiritual shepherd. And it applies local level to a priest, but definitely, as you see, it's more so for an a bishop. And I think the problem is the short-sightedness of our modern-day hierarchy and every jurisdiction loses sight sometimes of those needs. I'm not saying they're not educated, but then I think their education sometimes goes back to what you said, might even be too refined, too detailed. It might be only on canon law. How are you a bishop to do all these other things if only focus on canon law? Or then they're only on ecclesiastical matters, right? Ecclesiastical formation uh, services, great. So you know how to serve. What about when you have to minister or mentor or offer theological care, pastoral care? And I think that's where these kind of come into play. And, um, you know, we have to really think about because, you know, those are the ones who lead us. Those are the ones who guide us. And so even for myself as a priest, to look into this, it gives me an opportunity to really contemplate and figure out for my own self how I can be a better shepherd to this local flock, how I can listen and serve better and 
continue to grow. I am not, I am not at a peak. I will not be at a peak. Uh, I don't want to plateau because if I plateau, I become, I can then become apathetic and then I can become lethargic. And then I won't have a drive to want to grow to learn so they can grow at the serve the faithful. And so that's something we all have to think about our own levels um, uh, that we can really enhance and build from there. So um, that's it, guys. Um, that's all that we have. I really thought this was an incredible book. I hope you guys really enjoyed it as well, too. Can you say it in Greek? I don't know. I might get it in Greece. Yeah, I don't think they made it in Greece because it's excerpts from his books in Greek. So the but, that, but that means him, his books in Greek. Plus yeah, yeah, yeah. His books in Greek exist. We go, so if you look here, look at the beginning. No, you'll see it. Here, it says here. See, but the best I use like that is the vast and epistol on two, right? And then you have other ones. The Loico Sinadrium Methema, or as like that is the Maturgos. They already have the books. These are excerpts from the books translated to English to apply to, uh, to this book. So this book is not a Greek creation. You can find Greek creations of his other uh, service here printed in China. There you go. That's the answer. What was it printed? Printed in China, so it will not be in Greece. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's just printed in China. Wow. Everything goes. We're here Friday now. Bye everyone. Thank you. Go ahead.